Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to have you all with us this evening again. So thanks very much for joining us. And uh, tonight we have another exciting uh, live session. This is our uh, second live session for this month, which is based on infectious uh, diseases theme. And we're so lucky to have Professor Richard Brensis with us uh, for a live talk on uh, whip warm infections and how our bodies actually do react to these infections, how our immune system actually fights with them. So before we start learning about this topic, I would like to introduce uh, our structure to those who are uh, maybe new to our platform. So in the next um, half an hour or so, Professor Grensis will be telling us about how these uh, parasitic worms infect our bodies, how the immune system works to control it, and how actually this parasite avoids uh, immune destruction. So after this, we will have a brief uh, comfort break and resume back, <clears throat> excuse me, for a question and answer session. session. So during the um, talk or during the break, please feel free to leave your questions um, either to um, the YouTube chat area or please um, let us know about your questions by email or through our social media accounts. Uh, so during the um, discussion as well, Q&A session, if you feel like there are some follow up questions, please keep posting those because I will be checking the uh, YouTube uh, for additional questions. So uh, before I actually leave the stage to Richard, I would like to briefly introduce uh, him to yourselves. So Richard is a professor of cellular immunology at the University of Manchester. And he is um, trained as a zoologist and throughout his career, he has been investigating how our bodies respond to parasitic worm infections. And she has been he's been driving these um, advancing knowledge on um, how we can use this uh, information to, for applying it to, um, as far as I remember, uh, inflammatory uh, diseases. So Richard, thank you for accepting our invitation. It's um, a, our pleasure to have you with us. And we're all looking forward to hearing about your research. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, it is a pleasure to talk to you and thank you for taking time out to listen. And I hope you will find uh, what I've got to say of interest and I look forward to answering questions. So just as a, as a brief in, introduction, as you've heard, I'm from the University of Manchester. I'm a professor of immunology and I work in the Lydia Becker Institute of Immunology and Inflammation at Manchester. And I'm also part of the Wellcome Trust Center for Cell Matrix Research. That sounds quite a mouthful. It just means that we've got a, a great bunch of scientists working on, on cutting edge uh, immunology here in Manchester. So I'm a professor of immunology. I've been so since 1998, which is a long time ago. Uh, and the title of my talk is This Wormy World, Parasites, Friends or Foe. Um, would you like to start sharing your screen? We're not able oh, to see oh. them yet. Oh, right. I, let me just finish that. It must have flipped off for some reason. Let's go. Back. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry about that. So my my very uh, controlled uh, introduction didn't quite work off, but we'll get there. Don't worry. Okay, is that better? Yeah, definitely. We can see it. So sorry for that, uh, just rewind a little bit. Anyway, you heard what I've said and where I work, and these are just some nice pictures and logos to represent that. Uh, and what I want to talk to you today, uh, following the title of my talk, is This Wormy World, Parasites, Friends or Foe. And I'm going to speak to you about these particular organisms. So these are animals. Uh, they're worms, and they're probably not the normal type of worm that you generally think about. We often tend to think about earthworms, and these are a different kind of worm, but uh, no less interesting and, and important. They have a mouth, an anus, a gut, a primitive nervous system. They have uh, 
reproductive organs. And as you can see, they can give rise to, to, to smaller juvenile stages. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So by the end of today's talk, I hope you'll begin to appreciate these particular kinds of worms a little bit more than perhaps you did before you listened to me today and start to understand how interesting they are and how our immune system has difficulty in dealing with them, but also perhaps what we can learn from these kinds of organisms uh, using mechanisms that they've evolved over, over thousands and thousands of years to thwart our immune system, can we capture that in any meaningful way going forward? So these worms are round worms. They're not segmented worms like earthworms and their scientific group name are the nematodes. They are the most abundant animals on the planet and people often don't realize this. Why should you? But they are. There are millions of species believed to exist, some of them not defined yet, and they're all around us. And recently, scientists have estimated that the number of nematodes, these roundworms that live simply in the top six inches of soil in the world is 440 quintillion. So that's a very silly large number. But as a way of comparison, you can say that scientists have also estimated that the total number of insects in the world is at 10 quintillion. So we believe that there are more nematodes, these roundworms on the planet, than all other animals put together. So they are an incredibly successful group of organisms. Just to give you a little bit of, of biology to, 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 to put you in the picture, Nematodes all have a very similar life cycle in the way that they live. They get bigger by molting, a little akin to sort of insects, they molt, and they all go through four juvenile or larval stages, as we call them, and they molt four times to become adults, and for, for the majority of, of these roundworms or nematodes, they, they turn into male and female adult parasites, and then they mate, and then the females lay eggs, and it's the eggs that start off the life cycle again when they hatch to become the first larval stage. So that's a common feature of all nematodes, no matter where they live. Now, they vary enormously in their adaptations and their size, certainly. The smallest nematodes are believed to be around about 80 microns in length. So what does that mean? That's about the width of an average human hair. But the largest nematodes have been recorded up to about 30 meters in length, some nematodes that parasitized uh, large whales. So they're very varied in size, but they all stick to this same basic way of growing uh, and reproducing. Now, many species of nematodes have evolved to live inside animals, including man. And uh, these are known as parasitic nematodes. And the most common parasitic nematodes we have uh, in, in uh, animals and humans are uh, the, uh, those that live in the intestine. And it's these particular groups that I've been involved in researching uh, over the last uh, 20 or five to 30 years or so. They actually have no preference for who they infect or what they infect. They'll infect kings and paupers alike. And so this is, if you look here, a couple of bricks and this sort of large lump of spaghetti on the top of the bricks are actually a pile of adult uh, uh, roundworms of, of man, the common large roundworm of man, which is called Ascaris in its Latin name. And so that, these, all these parasites come out of the intestines of a small Kenyan girl who was identified as having an infection and she took a, a, a drug to clear the worms out. And these are the worms that were living in her intestine. So it'll infect small children, people from poor countries and in poor environments, but also it will infect rich people. And this I just thought was interesting that when they discovered King Richard III in a his body or the remains of his body in a car park in Leicester in 2012. They did a little bit of science on him and they found out that he also was infected with this same species 
uh, of roundworm in the intestine. And currently we believe that around one in seven of the world's population is infected with at least one type of intestinal nematode or roundworm. And in fact, often people are infected with two and three species at the same time. And of course, we've known that animals have been infected with intestinal dwelling parasite worms for, for, for much longer than that. And this is a, a drawing of what people thought cynodonts, a type of dinosaur, looked like. And these were prevalent around about 270 million years ago. And we've got pretty good evidence that they had intestinal uh, roundworm parasites too. And in terms of what the infections do to people who are infected, they can cause considerable disease, especially in children who are usually the most heavily infected. And that's given rise to many public health campaigns in areas where these parasites are prevalent. They can affect how the children grow, obviously. They become malnourished, and that has knock-on effects for their ability to go to school and to learn well, and therefore contribute to society. So although they don't tend to kill large numbers of people, they do have much more insidious effects on infected populations. The other thing to realise is that these infections are long-lived, and in places where these worms are very prevalent, most people have infections for most of their lives. And that suggests to me that our immune system does not seem to be very good at getting rid of them. And it, and it poses questions. One is, can our immune system actually get rid of these large parasites or are they just too big for the immune system to deal with? And the answer is, yes, they can get rid of, uh, of these large parasites. And that's something that we've been actively researching. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute or two. And also we want to know, well, how does our immune system get rid of these parasites? And that's something that we've also been very interested in and I'll talk to you about a little bit later on. Now, what we do know from work in our own laboratory and those of many other researchers around the world is that the type of immune response that actually is associated with being able to clear some of these parasites is the type of immune response that we're most familiar with when we think about allergic responses or allergic disease. So if you have hay fever, as shown by this uh, lady up the top left, or if you're allergic to house dust mite, these are house dust mites here, you have a skin allergy to your cat, for example, you can see these wheels and flares on the skin here, or, you're like this guy, although I never know why he smiles a lot, because he's allergic to bee venom and has been stung in the eye by a bee. This type of response that gives rise to this runny nose, itching, swollen skin or swellings around uh, the eye here. And also with much more important and then serious diseases, such as if you've got allergic asthma, this kind of immune response and how the immune system deals with these kinds of challenges, whether it be pollen or, or other allergens, are very similar to the responses that we think are important in getting rid of these large multicellular parasites. And I know that I don't have time to really give you a, a real in-depth uh, explanation of how the immune system works, but I guess we're all pretty well up on our immunity during the last 18 months, but, but some very basic facts that are help orientate you going forward. Different types of infections and agents are controlled by different types of immune response. You might think quite sensibly that the response that you need to get rid of a tiny subcellular virus is quite different than you need to get rid of a 30 centimeter uh, parasitic worm, and that's true. And so the immune system has to put together the limited number of cells it's got and the sort of soluble molecules of the immune system in a way that's appropriate to control the different kinds of infections. And one of the central features that we've learned about over the last 20 years is that our immune responses are very exquisitely controlled and orchestrated into their different roles by soluble proteins produced by immune cells and they're known as cytokines. And you'll have heard about them when people talk about cytokine storm. But essentially they're signaling molecules and there's over 60 or 70 of them been identified and they're put together 
in different combinations to drive different kinds of immune responses. And the type of immune responses we now know that drive allergies involves white blood cells such as lymphocytes and particularly white blood cells known as T helper cells. And don't be worried about the names, but as they, their names suggest, they help generate immune responses. And they really are the cells par excellence that secrete these cytokines. And there's lots of different ones. But in an allergic response, you tend to generate and produce certain cytokines, not all cytokines, but a certain group of them. And then known as interleukins, some of the common ones. And that just means molecules that act between leukocytes or white blood cells. So interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-9. And importantly, one that's really come to the fore over the last 10 years or so, interleukin-13. And these can act on other white cells and other cells of the body, such as those known as granulocytes, and they're called granulocytes because they have granules in their cytoplasm. And this is a classic one that you may have heard of. If you have allergies, certainly, this is a mast cell and you can see all the little purple granules in its cytoplasm. And so these cytokines can influence the production of these different cell types uh, and also other cell types such as uh, mucin producing cells, which is very pertinent when you've got allergic asthma or you've got hay fever, for example. And the mucus is produced by cells called goblet cells. And here you can see it's a goblet shaped cell and it's full of mucin granules that get squirted out into our lungs and into our intestine. So we know the kind of immune response and particularly cytokines like interleukin-13, which are really key to uh, generating allergy. And we believe this is important in helping protect ourselves against these large worm infections. And the, and the worm that I, my lab has been working on for the most part over these years is a particular type of worm called whipworm. And here you can see why it's called Whitworm, this is a, there's an electron micrograph or an electron microscope picture of the worm and its head end is up the top here, burrowing into some cells and its fat back end at the bottom is the whip-like handle, but it's perhaps better shown by a drawing from the late 18th century, which very clearly shows why it's called a whipworm. And uh, we believe that about one in 15 people are currently infected by this particular parasite. Just to drive it home a little bit more locally, this is, uh, this is the Lindau man. He's a man that was killed and thrown into a peat bog in, in South Manchester about 2000 years ago. And where they discovered his body, they were found that he was actually infected with whipworm as well. So whipworm has been with us uh, for thousands of years and has spread right across the globe. But whipworm is not only an infection of humans, and in fact, all these different species of animal that I show in this little collage here have been shown to have their own particular uh, whipworm infection. They're very, very common. They've adapted to be very successful about parasitizing animals on the planet. And here we've just got a, a, a picture, a little movie to show you some uh, live whipworms here on a piece of intestinal tissue. And these are whipworms that naturally infect mice. And these whipworms are about two centimeters long and they bury themselves into the intestinal tissue as adult parasites. Now, whipworms actually like to live in one particular part of the intestine and they like to live in part of the large intestine as shown at the top left here known as the cecum. So this is our stomach and these are all the thinner things are our small intestine and they turn into the large intestine or colon. And it's this first bit of the large intestine that whipworms really like to live in. And it doesn't matter what your cecum looks like, whether you're an opossum or a koala or a kangaroo, and they look quite different in these different animals. But if you, if you want to look, this is where you would find the whipworm. This down the bottom here is the first known drawing of a human cecum was done by Leonardo da Vinci. And it's interesting that there have been studies to show that in Leonardo's time, certainly in Italy, there are plenty of people infected by uh, human whipworm, perhaps Mona Lisa herself. 
Now, infection by all species of whipworm occurs when you swallow parasite eggs produced by the female parasites. And this is the characteristic whipworm egg. It looks like a rugby ball, but you can see the, the parasite, the first stage of the larvae coiled up inside. And the cecum and the large intestine is also the major site of our intestinal microbiome. We've all heard about how, it imp how important our intestinal health is due to the commensal bacteria that we have living in our intestines. And this is exactly the place where Trichuris likes to live. And in fact, we know that the bacteria attach to the ends of the Trichuris eggs when they get swallowed, and we believe actually are important in inducing hatching. So this is a movie where we've taken some Trichuris eggs and we've added intestinal bacteria. And this is what happens when you do that. It activates the parasite inside the egg. And then you see the parasite, the first stage of the larvae pushes out and this will go on to invade the intestinal tissue of the cecum. And in fact, the whipworm buries itself into the cells of the cecum of the large intestine. And this is looking down onto the surface of uh, the large intestine. And you can see all these worms that are snaking about in tunnels they've made in the intestinal tissue. The intestinal cells, the other important thing to remember is, is that our intestines renew ourselves constantly. So all the surface cells of our intestine renew themselves every two to three days. So as you're watching, your cells are turning over and the cells that you've got in your intestinal surface today weren't there uh, last Tuesday. They've changed. So the parasite is living in a constantly moving cellular escalator where cells in the gut start to proliferate and then they move up and they move onto the surface of the gut and then get shed off. So it's a constant challenge to the parasite to maintain its position. But they do that and they go through their different the life cycle molts and become adult parasites. They mate and the female parasites start to produce eggs. And you end up with the females shedding uh, batches of eggs out into the contents of the gut, which pass out with the feces or the poo. And then they embryonate and grow and mature outside until somebody else comes along and eats them. So what do we know about uh, how the immune system can control whipworm? I've told you that it's an allergic type response and I've highlighted that this one cytokine interleukin-13 we think is very important and also that the parasite has to live in a, a constantly moving tissue. Well, what we believe we've been able to show is actually the immune system plays an important role in modifying the place where the parasite lives. So if you look on the left, we have some very badly drawn but happy worm parasites that are living in an intestine that slowly moves its cells up as we are doing as we're sitting here watching uh, the talk today and moving off into the gut. But when the immune system is in, activated by whipworm to make interleukin-13, what happens is that the speed in which these cells move is accelerated and the worms are actually carried up and they turn up the escalator, if you like. They speed up the escalator to clear the parasites out of the gut. So they don't kill them. They just move them out of the intestine. And this is all driven particularly by these particular allergic type molecules and this one interleukin-13. But I told you right at the start that actually immunity to whipworm doesn't seem to work very well. And we know that is because people have parasites for a long time and therefore interleukin-13, if we think it's important, is not doing its job. And why is that? Well, we went back to look at the biology of the parasite a little bit more, and we know that when they're living in the intestine, whipworms secrete hundreds of different proteins into the environment in which they live. But interestingly, all these proteins, there's hundreds of them, but they're dominated by one single protein. And I've shown this schematically here with the blue dots. 
So they squirt out lots of material into the place in which they live. And most of it is this one single protein. And therefore we rationalize that maybe this was an important molecule for the parasite and therefore it had an important role. And we set out to try and identify what this protein did and if it had any function and was of importance. And so this took a long time to do because it was a re really uh, difficult molecule to work with, but eventually we were able, first of all, to get a structure of, of this particular molecule. I know this doesn't look like much, but if you fill it in, you can see that it's a sort of globular protein. This is a single protein. And what was fascinating to us was that it was a completely new protein to science. Out of the hundreds of thousands of proteins that were in the database, nothing looked like it at all. It seemed to be completely novel. We called it imaginatively P43 because it had a molecular weight of 43,000 Daltons, but that stuck. And when we looked at it in detail, we were able to find that as shown in red here, there were little bits of the molecule that reminded us of some, of some important molecules of the immune system. And that is the receptors for certain cytokines. And this showed a very similar uh, structure to the receptor for interleukin-13, the very cytokine that we thought that the parasite didn't want hanging around. And in fact, you can show by computer stimulation and more importantly, experimentally, that this cytokine, immune cytokine, interleukin-13, is mopped up by this molecule that the parasite makes. So it binds very strongly to IL-13. And even more interestingly, is that if you put some of this parasite-derived molecule uh, into the nasal cavities of a mouse, that's a, that gets allergic lung inflammation, then this parasite molecule will suppress the allergy that the mouse suffers. You can think about this in a slightly different way. I'm suggesting that parasites and whipworm in particular can secrete a molecule that can interfere, interfere with uh, inflammatory responses. And you can ask the question, well, does having worms therefore reduce your risk of having inflammatory diseases. And people have been looking into this epidemiologically over the last 20 or so years. And I'm just putting up some maps here to get you thinking. So what we're looking here is, the is at the distribution of human inflammatory diseases and parasitic worms. And on the left, we're looking at the incidence of autoimmunity, inflammatory disease and allergy. And on the right, we're looking at uh, the distribution of parasitic worm infections, and they don't overlap. And so it looks like if you have parasitic worms as part of your natural uh, exposure, then you're uh, a much lower incidence of getting autoimmunity, inflammatory disease, and allergy. But in those areas of the world where we've largely cleared uh, parasitic worms and certainly intestinal parasitic worms uh, from our bodies, we're now much more subject to autoimmunity, inflammatory disease and allergy. So to finish up, uh, there's a number of things I hope you've learned from uh, this short talk. One, that parasitic worms are everywhere. Everywhere you look, you will find parasitic worms. All the wild animals will have intestinal parasites or your dogs and cats get intestinal parasites, or your birds, reptiles, everything will have intestinal parasites. So they are everywhere. They cause disease. So I'm not minimizing that they're a problem. They're a problem for farmers, they're a problem for pet owners, and they're a problem for people who get heavy infections. But they've evolved ways to control inflammation. They are really, really good at doing this. And therefore, I think we can learn from them to develop new ways to help control inflammatory disease. And I think I've just given you one example of the ways in which we think that we might be able to exploit these parasitic diseases uh, to our own advantage when we're thinking about uh, inflammatory disease. So that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Lovely. Thanks very much for this interesting um 
talk. It was really interesting, especially to learn about how um, inflammatory disease, autoimmune diseases and parasitic worm infections do not match uh, all over the world. So um, I'm, sh I'm sure there will be questions about that. And let's resume back at 10 past seven and um, go through our questions to Professor Grensis. So Richard, thanks very much. It was lovely. So see you in 10 minutes. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for submitting your questions. Obviously, it was an interesting talk. We have got a lot of questions that we need to go through, so I'm not going to um, waste any more time and uh, start uh, going through these questions. Uh, so um, the first question, um, Richard, is about could parasitic worms uh, administered in a clinically appropriate way protect you against autoimmune inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid conditions? So uh, this is, uh, thank you for asking the question. And it's a, a question that's been asked now, I guess about 10 to 15 years and people are actively investigating this. There's been quite a lot of studies using both whipworms, but other kinds of uh, intestinal dwelling parasites such as hookworms to try and see whether this is a, a therapeutic reality. And the results, I have to say, have been quite varied. I don't think there's any doubt that these parasites can modulate immune systems, but whether giving people actual infections is the right way to go, I'm not so sure. So some of the studies have been quite encouraging. Uh, some of the studies have been less so, so they've tried whipworms with some allergies and that's not worked very well, but they've also tried whipworms with uh, other inflammatory conditions such as multiple sclerosis and although the results haven't been quite as strong as you might have hoped, there's some indication that there might be something happening. And some people have tried hookworm with, uh, with uh, celiac disease. And again, sometimes it seemed to work, sometimes it didn't. So I think, I think that the, the, the jury's out at the moment, uh, but people are actively looking at it in a very carefully and well-defined way to see whether that's a, an approach that might be useful based on the idea that if the worm can do it properly, the worm is the best way, best way of delivering this kind of approach. But I think, I'll shut up in a second, the way that it's going forward is they're trying to look at the ways in which the parasite do it rather than administer the infection as well, because these infections can cause damage when you have them. So it's, it's maybe not an ideal way to do it, but certainly it's a sensible thing to ask and people are looking at it very hard. Okay, so in terms of um, sort of administration, so how are they actually administering this to patients? So, so uh, one of the guys was a, was a gastroenterologist who started this off in, in Iowa. And he used to have a small glass of Gatorade, a fizzy pop, and he used to put about two and a half thousand pig whipworm in it and get people to swallow it. And so they just administered it orally, just like you would naturally get infected by these parasites. Or with the hookworms, they give it as you would get a hookworm infection, which is a little bit more tortuous because you apply the larval stages to your skin. They burrow through the skin, it gets into your circulation, they go into the blood circulation of your lungs. They crawl up and they burst out and crawl up your trachea and then drop back down into your intestines and grow as adult parasites. So that's a bit of a tortuous route to do this, but that's the way they go. And that's how people have been treated in trials. Okay, okay, that's very interesting. So, um... So are they actually testing it on patients who already have, for example, multiple sclerosis or are they doing it? All right. So already have. So has anyone actually looked at the I guess we're going to need a couple of decades to see the follow up data on whether or not it has a protective effect? Exactly. I think I think it's 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 very difficult to give it to people who haven't started suffering from the condition. Uh, and I suppose they would argue, well, you know, maybe we've got some natural uh, data from that from endemic areas where people have had worms in the past and haven't had such high levels. So, for example, allergies in Eastern Europe, for example, where farmers were living in close contact, you know, they put their kids and babies out with the animals 
when they were doing their work and stuff and they got exposed to these things so there was there's some some uh, epidemiological evidence that natural exposure does reduce your chances of getting these kinds of things but that's not quite the same as treating somebody once that once they once well, so they have it yeah yeah okay yeah. lovely thanks very much and thanks for this interesting uh, question martin so moving on to the next question so is it in any way possible to have parasites as part of the microbiota with no resulting health problems so, uh, I, I, well, it's difficult to say. I mean, if you read a lot of textbooks, people have always said, well, intestinal worm infections don't cause many problems. And these are people that have written them have never had intestinal worms. And I think certainly heavy infections in children can cause severe problems. But by and large, as I've mentioned, they don't kill you. And you do acquire some level of immunity, although it's not very strong immunity. And most people tend to have a few parasites for most of their lives. And they might argue that actually they're not suffering any ill effects. And I do know one or two rather odd parasitologists who actually have auto infected themselves with some uh, intestinal dwelling parasites on the basis, one, that actually it's better for their health because that's how we've naturally evolved with a few parasites. So my commensals might be better with a few worms knocking around. Mm -hmm. And other, another one, and it's usually anecdotal because it's only one person, have reported that their, for example, their psoriasis has got better while they were infected with the parasite. So I would say yes, in, 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 in grand terms, our natural intestinal flora would have bigger things than bacteria and fungi in them. It would certainly have some parasites throughout evolution and a few protozoan or single-celled infections as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So, um, again, one of the audiences um, um, just thanking you for this fascinating talk. And they're just asking, um, they're interested in this P43 protein and its effect on the lungs of mice. So yeah. the question is, is there any work being done to investigate whether it could be used in asthma or even COVID-19? Well, so that's a very interesting question because uh, the, the individual might know that, that, that it, one of the things about long COVID, and I'm, I'm extrapolating here, is the fact that you get fibrosis in your lungs after long-term infection in COVID and other uh, lung diseases and interleukin 13 is one of those cytokines that causes this fibrosis so it, it it can cause damage and so people are actively looking to see whether you can interfere with IL-13 to prevent damage in the lungs and I would like to think that maybe we can learn something from this P43 molecule. All I can say is we're pursuing that and that uh, Certainly the human whipworm, we've done it in mouse whipworm parasites and the human whipworm parasite also has uh, a, an equivalent P43 molecule and that molecule will also interfere with uh, IL-13, interleukin-13 binding on human cells as well. So there's no reason to suppose that it might not work, but we haven't done any work in humans yet. It's, it's a little way off that. It's, it's a lot to get through before you can start uh, putting these molecules into humans, but I see no reason why it isn't worth exploring, absolutely. Okay, okay, great. And just a follow-up question, uh, not a follow-up, but a question which actually uh, goes in the um, sort of um, in the same uh, line, parallel to what has been discussed. So what about treatment with a P34-like molecule to cap down interleukin-13 levels? Well, I think that, that, that you should do that. I mean, I, the thing about this parasite molecule is it it's, it's, has unusual properties. So what it does is not only does it bind IL-13, it sticks to the surface molecules that are secreted by tissues as well. So what it does is it, it sort of, when it's produced, it will stick to the local tissue and then it tethers itself. And then if IL-13 comes along, it sort of soaks up the IL-13 which is quite different to the way that you usually block IL-13 into the kin 13 which you would do by, say, injecting a monoclonal antibody or a soluble receptor that would bind it. This actually physically sticks to the tissues and acts as a, a sponge for IL-13 that's produced locally. 
Okay. So I think, yeah, it's there's, there's interesting possibilities about how it works different from the way we normally try to block IL-13. Okay, lovely. So I'm assuming there are studies uh, through which people are looking for agents that can actually modulate the levels of IL-13 in our bodies. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think it's it's one of the, since it became very prevalent as being important in certainly allergic type responses or fibrotic responses. There's a lot of interest in different, and maybe we will maybe we will get some of that. I don't know. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So the next question is: um, So how did Richard the Third acquire his warm infection? Well, Richard III was just like everybody else at the time. He probably didn't wash his hands or wash his vegetables very well. So, so uh, it, the mode of infection with Ascaris is just in, you ingest the eggs, right? And the eggs are incredibly tough. Why we can find things like Trichuris eggs and Ascaris eggs is because they're so tough and they last for many years in the soil. So if you think about it, the female worms that live in the intestine of both these species shed the eggs out, they pass out when people go for a poo. And if that contaminates the soil, or you use night soil as a fertilizer on your vegetables, the eggs will be there and they will last a long time. And then if you don't wash them or clean them, or you contaminate your hands or your vegetables with uh, the eggs, then as soon as you ingest them, the infection will proceed. So I guess that in Richard III times, even if he was a king, they weren't as clean in their hygiene as, as we might have expected them to be. So he would have just picked it up. And it would have been much more prevalent in those days in the UK. So it would have been everywhere. So most people would have had it and he was no exception. Okay, great, thank you. So again, one of the audience is thanking you for this interesting talk. So are there um, other types of whipworms like other family members? And how could you actually test someone for uh, the presence of these parasitic worms? Okay, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's only one species that we know usually infects humans. It's a particular name, it's called Trichuris trichura. That's the human parasite. And very closely related species will infect apes and monkeys. There's a species that infects pigs very readily called Trichuris suis. And actually occasionally people might get infected with that. But usually the parasites have adapted so they live best in the host in which they've evolved. Uh, and the classic way that you, you, you identify, I'm afraid it's not very savory at, uh, at dinner time in an evening, is actually you look for the eggs that are present in the feces. So you take a, a sample of feces and you mix it up with a little bit of water and you put it on the microscope slide and you look and you can see, certainly for Trichuris and Nascus, they're very characteristic and you can look under a microscope and diagnose them. So if you've got eggs in your feces, then you are infected. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. So um, the next question, do we share the same species of worm with other members of the animal kingdom? Well, as I've just mentioned, I think that's sort of the same sort of questions. We tend to be infected by Trichuris trichura because we've adapted with that particular species in humans and some primates. Well, you can get catch it from primates and primates can probably catch it from us because they're very similar. Our physiology is very similar. So the pig is slightly different, although because of the studies that have been done using Trichuris suis as preventative against sort of inflammatory bowel disease or multiple sclerosis, it's very clear now from studies that the pig whipworm will infect humans productively. So I think there are some that infect. I don't know of any studies that have, have actually looked at infecting people with other different species. So it can happen, but I wouldn't expect us to be promiscuous for every trichera species. I think it's there'll be a few and they'll be with uh, species that share our physiology a little bit better and that we come into contact with such as domestic stock and things like that. Okay, lovely, great, thank you. And the last question, um, are ozonophils involved um, the audience is saying that they have a vague memory that lots of eosinophils in blood was indicative of a parasitic infection. 
Absolutely. So eosinophils are sort of a, an old sort of diagnostic way of a either you're allergic or you have a worm infection. So if you took your blood, you took a blood sample and you looked for white blood cells in, if you had a lot of eosinophils, people would say that either you've got a worm infection because it's that type of allergic response that and an eosinophil is involved in allergic responses, or you've got allergy to something. But whether eosinophils are important in protecting against infection is, is a difficult thing to say. I don't think that there's much evidence to say that eosinophils protect against trichuris or ascaris, but they may do when the parasite is moving around in the body in the case of ascaris, or it may do against other worm infections. But what I think happens is that the immune system recognizes a big, large multicellular parasite and it mounts a whole panoply of immune responses, eosinophils, mast cells, goblet cells, IgE antibody, different types of responses. It doesn't know the exact species of worm it's getting, but it knows it's a big multicellular thing. And what happens is that one of those things usually works well against a particular parasite. And some of them will be redundant. And so it just throws what it can at it, uh, in the hope that one of those things will work. And what you can observe is that the parasite, pretend, depending on which species, usually evolves to downregulate or thwart those bits of the immune response which work against it. And it leaves the others alone because it doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Lovely. Well, we have been bombarding you with questions for the last 15 minutes. And uh, you might be tired by this point. So I would like to thank you for this interesting talk. I certainly le learned some new things as well. And uh, it was a pleasure having you with us. No, it was a pleasure talking to you. So thanks very much indeed. Lovely, thank you. So before I close the session, I would like to just remind everyone that it's our anniversary uh, month uh, next month. So please keep your eyes and ears open for the competitions that we're going to have and for the live events that we're going to have. So we're going to have a little change uh, for the format of our live uh, sessions. So um, see you next month and take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.